hello everyone uh, good morning um, my name is rakesh uh, and today i'll be presenting uh, a brief introduction to mqsim uh, which is a state of the art ssd simulator that is widely used in both industry and academia so let me quickly jump to uh, the outline for today's meeting so today we'll be looking at uh, the a brief refresher on uh, the internal components of a modern ssd and uh, these are the components which mqsim uh, models in the simulator and then we'll go through an introduction to mqsim then we'll look at how mqsim works uh, the the mechanism of mqsim then we look at the code structure and uh, how to configure mqsim uh, to to run some tests or uh, to check the performance of the configuration that you need uh, so now let's look at the internal components of a modern ssd so uh, a modern ssd uh, typical ssd is uh, has two parts to it one is the front end and the back end part so the back end part is basically the actual flash chips or the flash packages uh, so th these these can be uh, nand flash memory based uh, flash chips or uh, or it can be pcm chips or uh, it can also be something like 3d x point uh, packages which are uh, quite uh, new so uh, these these memory chips are connected through uh, through a, a shared channel and uh, and there can be multiple shared channels within the uh, ssd and uh, a number of flash chips are connected to each uh, shared channel and the flash chip is uh, if you look at the the architecture of a flash chip then you have multiple dies in in a flash chip these these dies are uh, independent uh, packages which can execute uh, uh, commands and uh, these are connected through uh, a bus interface uh, and uh, and also the, the each die contains two planes let's say uh, two or more planes and each plane will have blocks and pages within uh, within the blocks so this is the the back end uh, the components of a of the back end of the ssd now we look at the front end so the front end has a host uh, interface logic or the host interface layer which is which implements the protocol that is used to communicate with the host uh, two popular examples are sata and nvme um, and uh, these these the host interface layer basically uh, tries to uh, improve the parallelism uh, between the host and the ssd and then we have the flash translation layer which performs a bunch of uh, functions and manages the resources of the ssd uh, uh, it it manages the the mapping table which is a very critical part of the ssd and then it also uh, manages some of the queues and the buffers that are there in the ssd for uh, for uh, high performance uh, so these are this is the these are the responsibilities of the flash translation layer it also performs uh, critical functions like garbage collection and uh, wear leveling uh, and then the, then we have uh, something called the flash channel controllers which are uh, uh, the uh, the components which uh, send the commands to the to the actual flash chips and also uh, transfers data between the flash chips and the the front end so these these are the components of the uh, these are the components of front end and the back end of the ssd now um, what is the uh, let's look at ftl in uh, in a bit more detail so uh, ftl uh, as i said manages the ssd's resources and uh, why do we need the ftl uh, the the reason for uh, having the ftl is that there is a uh, flash memory itself has an inherent uh, um, limitation that the in, any new write that can that should be perform uh, any uh, that should be written on a page should be preceded by an erase operation so the flash writes can only be performed on pages that are erased and uh, so so every time there is an update for a for a logical address uh, sent by the host then we need to perform out of place updates which means that we write data to a different page and then we uh, 
mark the old page where the, the previous data was written as invalid. And uh, to do this, so to achieve this, we have a mapping table which is uh, which uh, translates the addresses, the logical addresses to physical addresses. And uh, so uh, this this mapping table helps in um, maintaining the current uh, location of the data, uh, which is mapped to a logical uh, uh, address. And uh, this mapping table is very critical uh, to the performance of the SSD, or to even the to uh, even make the SSD uh, functional. So in this case, uh, to improve the performance, there is also a cached mapping table, which means that there is a DRAM uh, component within the SSD, which uh, DRAM um, uh, space, where uh, this mapping table is partially stored to uh, improve the lookup uh, uh, of the uh, mapping table entries so so this is uh, this is about the mapping table so uh, how, what do we do with these invalid pages as as we have discussed in some of the earlier lectures uh, the garbage collection process which is uh, which is a key process in ssds uh, will reclaim all these invalid pages and it does it off the critical path of latency. So it can do it in the background whenever the, uh, the host operations are not being performed. So these uh, so these are some of the main responsibilities of the FTL. And it, uh, the FTL also has to perform the uh, something called where leveling, which uh, where the, the pages are written to uh, different blocks so that the age, age of the device is, uh, uh, I, or the they, the device is worn out uh, uniformly, so uh, so it has to take care of that as well. So uh, and you can see here there is also a cache management component which is uh, basically uh, uh, related to the data cache. So the DRAM is also used for a, uh, to store some of the recent entries that are uh, written or read from the uh, from the flash chips. So this acts like a cache, and uh, this is this also improves the performance and uh, decreases the resource contention. Uh, basically, the shared resources such as the channels and uh, and the chips, and uh, so it, it reduces the latency. So now that we have looked at uh, the there is the front end, the back end, and all the components of the SSD. Uh, this is mostly what uh, MQSIM models in the, in the simulator, and uh, we'll briefly look at what uh, and go through what the MQSIM does. So MQSIM can accurately model the uh, conventional SATA-based SSDs and uh, modern multi-queue SSDs as well. So uh, SATA-based SSDs are uh, SATA is a protocol which was uh, implemented for hard disk drives, which has rotating parts. And uh, multi-queue SSDs, uh, mostly NVMe uh, protocol, is, is has become the de facto standard for high-performance SSDs. So uh, MQSIM models both these protocols, and uh, and uh, it also supports uh, steady-state behavior with preconditioning. And it also models the end-to-end -end IO request latency. These three things are very critical to uh, understand the behavior of an SSD, uh, and we'll look at it in, in a bit more detail. So the MQSIM is uh, mostly f uh, flexible in design. It has modular components, and it also has the ability to support emerging non-volatile memory technologies. Uh, it it need it can you can. Uh, a user can actually go and uh, plug in uh, the configuration of a 3D X-Point uh, uh, chip or uh, a Samsung Xenad, which is one of the state-of-the-art uh, SSD for perf high performance. So it, uh, it actually can uh, support all these configurations. And it's also open source. And uh, it, we uh, this is the Git, GitHub link for uh, uh, anyone to download uh, the code and uh, and play with it. And it's mostly written in C++. So anyone with base, basic knowledge of uh, C++ can uh, easily understand the code. So um, so let's look at what is the support for multi-queue protocols. Uh, 
so a conventional host interface which is uh, most uh, which is for example sata interface is uh, was designed for magnetic hard disk drives originally and uh, it is it only supports thousands of uh, iops per device or the throughput is limited and uh, so in in a sata ssd so you have if let's say three processes are running uh, in the host system uh, the the operating system in the ho running on the host will have software io request queues which will uh, take the request from these processes and it sends it to an io scheduler the io scheduler has to basically uh, schedule these devices and send it to the device uh, request and send it to the device and it also has to maintain the fairness among all the io requests so uh, so the the key responsibility is in the, is on the uh, operating system here and uh, so we only have one uh, request queue which is interface which is uh, facing the device uh, or which through which the requests are sent from the host to the device and this is why it's uh, it's it's it happens in a serial manner so the requests are sent in a serial manner and the device will um, uh, will uh, perform the uh, or process the request. Uh, so th the reason for this is that it, it this was uh, designed uh, for hard disk drives where the the uh, the read or uh, where a read or a write operation would take uh, uh, a lot of time, and uh, that is the reason why there is a single queue which uh, which would be enough for uh, the performance of a hard disk drive, but this cannot work very well for a, a NAND flash or a state-of-the-art uh, NAND flash memory because uh, the, the the read and write latencies are much faster. So uh, to uh, to um, make the performance uh, better, uh, recent uh, a few years ago, uh, NVMe protocol was introduced, which uh, which basically introduces multiple queues um, and uh, so uh, there are many queues for each process to use and it takes advantage of the SSD throughput and enables uh, millions of IOPS per device. And this also avoids the OS intervention, which means that uh, the, the request can be sent directly to the, uh, to the device from the processes and uh, and these uh, request queues are hardware I/O request queues, so the process would directly uh, uh, put the request in these queues, and the SSD device can uh, handle these queues. So we have got rid of some of the overheads of the operating system, and uh, but the the main uh, uh, challenge here is that the SSD must perform the scheduling and also ensure the fairness. So. So, so MQSIM models these two uh, protocols, and uh, now let's look at what is a steady state model. So SSD should be evaluated in a steady state, uh, which means that uh, if the if the SSD is fresh out of the box, which is a new, if if the SSD is new, then uh, it cannot perform. Uh, it will. It's most likely unlikely that it performs garbage collection. So. If the garbage collection is not performed, then uh, we don't know how, uh, we would not know how the performance is impacted when there is garbage collection. And also in a, in a new SSD device, the data cache is not warmed up. So which means that the, there won't be any entries in the data cache and, um, and the request will have to um, go to the, to the backend all the time and it won't be served from the data cache. So many SSD uh, simulators actually simulate only fresh out of the box, dev box devices, or it incorrectly models the steady state behavior. And why is this uh, difficult is because it's very slow. M modeling the steady state behavior is very slow because it we need to write uh, a large number of, large amount of data to the SSD. Uh, to fill the capacity of the SSD, where and uh, if the uh, that is when the garbage collection gets triggered, and also some of the traces that are available in uh, 
uh, available online are, are not large enough for a proper warm up of the device. So that is that is the reason why it's very critical to perf to evaluate the SSD in a steady state, where uh, garbage collection is getting triggered and uh, data cache is also um, having a lot of entries. Uh, there are some workloads which actually can uh, end up in uh, thrashing the data cache, which is also an important, which is also a critical behavior in which the SSD has to be evaluated. So now let's look at the complete model of request latency. And uh, in this, we have uh, taken a small uh, 4K uh, read request um, from the from the host to the backend. And we'll see how uh, MQSIM models the latency for at, uh, at each stage of the, uh, the request processing. So let's say, uh, a user application sends a read request for uh, four kilobytes. So then it, uh, the, the first thing that happens is it, it gets enqueued. The, the request is enqueued in the submission queue, which is, uh, th there are two queues in the, between the host and the uh, device. One is called the submission queue and uh, uh, there is a completion queue. So the, the request is put into the submission queue and the uh, result is, uh, uh, when when the request is processed, uh, an entry is put into the completion queue. So there can be multiple submission queues in the in the device. So um, a user application will enqueue an I/O job into the submission queue. Then the uh, the host memory will uh, into the host memory. The submission queues are in the host memory, and then um, the 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 request is sent to the uh, host interface layer through the PCIe protocol. Uh, and then from the host interface layer, uh, the, if the if it's a large request, it, it will be split into smaller requests. But in here in this example, we have a four kilobyte request. So it will be directly sent to the SSD firmware. And uh, the read request is transferred to the chip by the flash uh, uh, controller. And uh, the flash read op uh, read operation is performed in the NAND flash chip, and uh, from there the data transfer has to happen. The read the read data has to be sent back to the host, and uh, that is through the the flash channel. So this is uh, uh, the read data is sent from the flash chip to the flash channel through the to the firmware through the flash channel, and uh, from the firmware it is sent back to uh, to the host interface layer and back to the host memory. And this again is sent over the PCIe protocol. Now, uh, any simulator has to model all these, the latencies of all these data transfers and command transfers. So uh, let's see how much uh, a four kilobyte request takes. Um, so here we see that uh, the command transfer uh, usually takes around uh, less than one microseconds. And uh, the flash read itself, which is is one of the uh, main uh, latency components, uh, takes around 50 to 110 microseconds in a, a TLC uh, NAND flash memory. And then we have uh, the data transfer from the the flash chip to the uh, to the SSD firmware or to the FTL, which takes around 20 microseconds through the the flash channel. And then uh, the response or the data transfer from the uh, from the device to the host memory it takes around 4 microseconds so th these are some of the latencies that needs to be modeled by the simulator and mqsim does that uh, let's say you have a different configuration uh, let's say you have a samsung xenon um, ssd or a 3d exponent ssd um, so the ssd the simulator should also be able to adapt itself by because the flash read in those configurations take very less time compared to uh, what we see here it, it takes around three microseconds for a flash read operation and due to the high bandwidth availability in those in those devices even the data transfer latency takes uh, very less so the the simulator has to model these uh, latencies uh, in the in a correct manner, so uh, to uh, to model the performance of the device. Uh, 
So uh, let's look at what are the different comp latency components uh, that are modeled in the SSD backend. Um, we have the address and command transfer to the memory chip. And then we also have uh, flash memory read and uh, write uh, execution. So reads are typically faster, writes take a lot of time. Uh, for different NAND flash technologies, uh, let's say one bit, two bit, and three bit per cell. And we also perform uh, uh, data transfer uh, in case of write from the host to the to the flash uh, flash chip. And also in case of read, we need to transfer it, the data back from the flash chip to the host. So th these uh, these are the components that are modeled in the modeled in the MQSIM uh, latency components and uh, uh, these latency components are also modeled, taking into account the die and plane level parallelism. So as I mentioned in, in the introduction slide that uh, uh, a die is an independent execution unit. So if we send uh, commands to multiple dies, it can perform uh, the execution in parallel. And also the, similarly in, in, at a plane level, if you send a multi-plane command, uh, the execution is performed in parallel across different planes within a, within a die. So uh, these two uh, levels of parallelism also has to be accounted when calculating the latency. Uh, and also there are other advanced command execution uh, modes such as uh, multi-plane operations, as I said, and also copy back operations uh, where we actually don't transfer the data back to the to the host itself and it's it's kept in the buffers within the device and then moved back to the uh, uh, to the flash chip so uh, some of these advanced command executions also have to be uh, taken care and there is also a cache read command cache read and cache program commands uh, which uh, which needs to be um, uh, modeled as well so these are uh, some of the latency components and it also the simulator also needs to uh, be aware of the size of the read and write operations uh, write operations are typically performed in uh, uh, in a page sized manner so if the ssd supports around 16 kilobytes of bytes of size uh, page size we need to we need to always write uh, the the write operation should always be performed on in the page size uh, but read read operations can all uh, can be performed at a sub page page granularity so it can also it can be performed at 4 kilobytes 8 kilobytes uh, or 16 kilobytes so the ssd uh, simulator should be aware of uh, the the sizes of the read and write uh, operations so uh, so these are uh, these are some of the uh, some of the parameters that uh, the SSD simulator should be aware of while uh, modeling the latency at the back end. But at the front end, uh, as I said, we have uh, NVMe multi-queue and uh, SATA native command queue models for uh, modern SSD. Uh, so SATA native command is basically the, at the operating system level, it uh, the SATA, for the SATA protocol, the, uh, it, basically the uh, operating system decides on what is the priority of the of the of different requests or basically to enable fairness the operating system decides what which requests have to be scheduled first and uh, so on so these these things are modeled in the mqsim and for nvme protocol it uh, mqsim models different priority classes uh, I think there are four priority classes currently in MQSIM, uh, urgent, high, medium, and low uh, for the host side request queue. So uh, we can assign different priorities for different queues and uh, based on the priority, the requests are uh, processed in, in the order of the priority. And we also have uh, a data cache manager, which is a DRAM based cache, uh, like we saw in the introduction slide. Uh, which uses a least recently used uh, replacement policy to cache uh, recently accessed data. And uh, we also have uh, different FTL components uh, modeled in MQSIM, such as address translation unit, garbage collection, where leveling, uh, transaction scheduling unit, 
and uh, support for multi-flow request processing. So these are uh, some of the components which uh, which are modeled in MQSIM. Uh, and um, for more uh, comparison with other simulators and um, more details on each of these components, I would uh, encourage you to read the paper. And uh, it's a it's a nicely written paper with lot of results and uh, and uh, sensitivity analysis. So please take a look. So uh, so this marks the introduction to MQSIM, and I've, I've tried to give a good uh, I mean picture of what is going on and behind the scenes. So if you have any questions now, we can discuss. And so I'll move on to the next section. Okay, so next I'll move on to the mechanism of the simulator. So in the mechanism, uh, we MQSIM is a discrete event based simulator, which means that uh, each operation performed in by MQSIM is an event. Uh, let's say your, the command address transfer or the read data out that we discussed. Uh, these uh, these uh, operations are uh, considered an event and they are performed uh, at discrete times. Uh, so wh what, do I, what do I mean by discrete time? So there is a red and black, red black tree uh, that maintains the events in the order of their completion times. So each node in the red black tree has a key, which is which indicates the timestamp uh, of the event when it finishes, and also the value is the callback function. So when the when the event finishes or when the event is supposed to finish, a callback function is uh, called, which marks the end of the event. So for example, at at time five, a data transfer event starts and the event will execute for another five time units. So the simulator will insert a node with five plus five as the, the key and a callback function into the tree. So at each uh, simulation cycle, the simulator will try to find the smallest time uh, which has to be, uh, or the event which has the smallest time from at that point to execute and it will set the timer to that timestamp and execute the callback function. So, so the simulation engine works like this and uh, MQSIM can support real disk traces uh, from uh, uh, sources like MSR Cambridge uh, block IO traces or YCSB and also it can generate, generate it, its own uh, traces uh, which is called synthetic workloads. So this is uh, the mechanism of the uh, basic mechanism of the simulation uh, engine. Now we look at uh, the initialization of uh, MQSIM. So uh, MQSIM components uh, like FTL or the SSD device or the transaction scheduling unit are represented as objects and are maintained in the map. So these objects in the map are iterated through and corresponding functions are executed. So each object maintains their own version of uh, uh, of different inter interfaces which are required uh, for uh, uh, for the in the for the simulator to call the objects. So we need to have uh, uh, we need to actually uh, implement interfaces like setup triggers, start simulation. Which, uh, which is uh, called by the simulation engine. So if you look at this uh, figure, you, you will see that there is a setup triggers function which is getting called. So when the, when the simulator is getting initialized, you, it goes through all the objects that are there in the, in the map, and then it will, it, it will call setup triggers. What does setup triggers do? It will basically uh, look at the, the nature of the object and it will, um, it will basically uh, see if there is any notification or a trigger that needs to be uh, set up for that object. And uh, there is also a validate simulation config, which is uh, where it goes through all the objects again in the map 
and then it will validate whether the configuration of that particular object, let's say the SSD device, is uh, uh, is correct. Uh, so, so that is about validate simulation config, and then it will also uh, go through the uh, the different objects and it will uh, execute the start simulation. So that is the the entry point for all these objects. So. In start simulation, we have um, a while loop, which will look at the the arbitrary that I, I just mentioned before, uh, and it will try to get the different uh, nodes from the arbitrary, and it will get the minimum the the node with the least uh, time timestamp, and uh, it will from use that node to fire the event. And to fire the event, it uses the execute simulator event uh, interface um, and uh, um, with that object. Uh, and then once it's uh, it, once it call, calls that uh, simulation event, it then uh, deletes the event uh, because it's already uh, triggered the event. So it deletes that event from the arbitrary. So, uh, so this is the basic idea of a start simulation function and uh, the callback function is is executors execute simulator event so we need to define the callback uh, function for each of these uh, uh, nodes uh, in the or each of these commands that we command or data uh, events that we uh, insert into the arbitrary so uh, so how do we and now that we have looked at um, how to initialize the MQSM and how to start the, uh, let's say the simulation. Uh, now we'll uh, look at how to add an event into the arbitrary. So uh, a simulator event is registered using uh, register sim event function. So in the register sim event function, it uh, basically uh, calls a constructor called sim event with all the different uh, parameters such as fire time, target object parameters and type, and then it in, inserts this event to the to the arbitrary, which is called event list here. So an event is registered, let's say, for sending a read command and uh, read uh, command and address. So we we basically uh, Call the register event a sim event, and we give the time, the current simulator time plus suspend time plus the uh, the read command time. So this is the timestamp for the uh, event to get executed, and then we call the um, callback uh, the macro which is which uh, is used in the callback function. So read command address transferred will be the macro which uh, is looked up in that callback function and uh, and then uh, the routine is executed. So this is how we uh, uh, register an event in the MQSIM. So th this kind of gives an idea of how uh, what are the, the key functions that needs to be uh, invoked in the MQSIM and what are, how do we, let's say, initialize this engine how do we start the simulation and uh, how do we register an event so tomorrow if we are adding a new uh, component into mqsim we need to uh, stick to these kind of uh, these interfaces and then uh, use this uh, register sim event to uh, to add an event so next uh, if you have any questions we can discuss now uh, or else I'll move to the uh, code structure uh, and look at how MQSIM, the, the code structure in MQSIM looks like and what are the different files that we need to look at. So any, any questions so far? Okay. So let's look at the code structure. So, um, MQSIM has a bunch of uh, files uh, and folders. If you if you take a dump of the GitHub code repository, um, so you have some things like the some of the main uh, folders that we need to look at is uh, are basically the source folder, uh, 
uh, the traces folder and uh, also files like uh, ssd config.xml and work workload.xml so ssd config.xml is basically a configuration file that uh, that is used to define the the preferred ssd configuration uh, it, it you can input uh, parameters related to a tlc nand uh, device or uh, a 3dx point device or a samsung z nand device in that in that xml then there is a workload.xml which defines the workload uh, parameters and we'll look at these two configuration files in a bit more detail in the next few slides so then uh, we have the traces folder which is uh, where the traces are kept if we need to have uh, use a trace based uh, uh, workload and then um, then we have the source folder where uh, you have a bunch of uh, folders inside that uh, let's say uh, the sim the sim folder is is contains files related to the simulation engine the nvm chip folder uh, contains uh, code related to the nvm chip uh, mostly to, uh, related to the back end of the ssd and it contains files for die plane block and page and uh, the ssd folder uh, inside the source folder contains files related to the uh, flash translation layer and the transaction scheduling unit and the host folder contains uh, files related to the the trace uh, based uh, workload generation and synthetic workload generation and also the pcie uh, protocol uh, which is which connects the host to the ssd now um, let's look at the code flow so uh, for any request it has to be uh, the request has to come from the host and then a data cache if there is a uh, let's say if it fits a read or a write it whether the data is available in the cache and then it looks at the address translation unit to see if there is a mapping entry in the uh, in the address uh, logical to physical mapping table um, if it's not there then a new entry has to be added then it goes to the transaction scheduling unit uh, which basically schedules the events to different uh, channels and chips in the backend and uh, it, it is sent through the flash controller and it goes to the nvm chip so this is a flow this is the flow from the front end to the back end and some of the important functions that we need to look at uh, are in the for a, for the data cache manager we need to look at process new user requests and uh, for the address mapping unit we need to look at translate lpa to ppa and dispatch uh, function and uh, for the transaction scheduling unit you need to look at uh, uh, schedule function and for from the flash controller we need to see the send command to chip uh, function for uh, uh, for knowing understanding how the code works uh, in each of these components so uh, so this is about the code structure uh, I'm sure there is a lot of uh, code there to understand and uh, read, but uh, this is just a brief introduction into uh, what, what are the important functions that we need to look at and how the code, uh, the flow, execution flow works. So next I'll, I'll go into how, how we configure the MQSIM and uh, so let's look at the ssd config.xml which is a file which we use to define the the preferred ssd configuration and uh, we have the host parameters uh, we look so we can define the the pcie lane bandwidth which is the external io bandwidth of the of each lane in the between the device and the host and this we can define in terms of gigabytes per second and uh, then we have the lane count so usually uh, pci gen 4 has around four lanes so we can define the number of lanes uh, through which the data is moved from the device to the host then uh, we have device parameters such as uh, host interface type uh, 
which is the type of host host protocol that was that is implemented in the uh, HIL, which is NVMe or SATA. And uh, we have the IO queue depth, which is the length of the host side queue. So in NVMe, we have multiple such queues, which um, which can take requests and parallelly execute them. Uh, so we need to define the length of the host side queue. And uh, we also have the data cache capacity, which is the size of the DRAM data cache in terms of bytes. Then we have something called the ideal mapping table. So, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we have a cached mapping table uh, to store some of the entries of the, the logical to physical uh, address translation uh, in, the, in the DRAM cache. But let's say if we want uh, all the entries to be cached in the uh, in the DRAM, then we set the ideal mapping table to be true, uh, which actually stores all the entries in the in the DRAM. This is not the case in a real SSD, but we do we can do this for uh, for checking the ideal performance. Um, otherwise, it uh, the SSD only stores a part of the entry into the uh, in the DRAM. And which is defined by the uh, cached mapping table size. And uh, uh, if there is any entry missing in the cached mapping table, then it has to go to the backend to uh, to fetch the mapping table entry. Uh, then we have the transaction scheduling policy, which is uh, which is the the scheduling policy to send the request to the backend. And uh, there are multiple policies that are already supported out of the box in the simulation, uh, in, in the simulator. Uh, one is called the out of order, which is based on a prior work. And uh, then we have priority out of order uh, uh, transaction scheduling policy. And uh, this implements out of order uh, policy with NVMe priorities. So as I said, the NVMe has uh, four priorities for different queues. Uh, like urgent, medium, high, and uh, low. So, uh, so these are uh, some of the components of the device. And if you look at the backend uh, configuration, we have uh, the flash channel count. How many flash channels are present in the device, and uh, the flash channel width, which is the bandwidth of each flash channel and uh, the chip number per channel. So how many chips are connected to each channel in the SSD backend? And in terms of NAND parameters, we have uh, we can support different uh, flash technologies. We can support SLC, MLC, and TLC uh, uh, flash cells. And also the page read latency for LSP, CSB, and MSB in case of a TLC page. Uh, TLC word line, uh, the, the, we can define different read latencies for these pages. And also we can have a page program latency, the block erase latency, and we can also define the endurance of the block by defining the P limit of the program erase cycle limit of each flash block. So then we have some more parameters like how many dies are there per chip, the number of planes per die, the number of blocks per plane, and, uh, and the number of pages per block. And we also have the page capacity, the uh, the metadata capacity. What is metadata capacity is that it, in every page, there is a small area of the page which stores the metadata, like the logical to physical address, um, the logical address of the page, and also, uh, uh, a signature and uh, many uh, things that are required by the FTL to uh, identify the page. So this is stored in the in a small area within the page called metadata. And uh, so this this is these are some of the key uh, parameters that are required in the SSD configuration file. So uh, a, any user who wants to use the simulator has to define all these parameters. There are some uh, default uh, file configurations that are already provided in the in the GitHub, uh, which you can also utilize. Then we look at the the workload configuration. So as I mentioned, there are two 
types of workload uh, that we can use in this uh, with the simulator. One is a trace based workload where um, we can define an IO scenario within this XML file, uh, the workload.xml, which, which defines a trace based uh, workload configuration. So th this has many parameters which will define the uh, the workload that uh, we use in our in the experiments. So let's say uh, if we set the channel IDs to seven chan eight channels, then the workload will uh, the the the, tra the re request in the trace will be sent through sent to all the seven chan all the eight channels. And uh, the number of chip IDs will be will define how many chips are being used in the by the workload, and uh, die IDs and plane IDs also define something similar. And then we have the initial occupancy percentage, which will define how much of the device is already occupied with uh, data. And uh, the file path will define the the trace uh, file, which which is used for uh, uh, generating the request and then uh, what percentage of the trace needs to be executed and the time unit, whether it's nanoseconds, uh, microseconds or milliseconds can be defined here. And uh, we can also define the priority class for the NVMe queues and uh, the device level data caching. So these are some of the parameters that are required for uh, a trace based uh, workload configuration. Then we have a synthetic workload configuration, which is uh, basically uh, configuring the simulator to generate its own uh, uh, request or the workload. So in this, we we again need to add a uh, add a, an uh, entry into the XML file, uh, something like IO flow parameters in set synthetic, which is which will define the synthetic workload. And we have similar entries like the trace based workload for uh, synthetic workload as well. But it also generates, um, since it generates its own request, we need to define the address distribution the and uh, the queue depth for the, uh, for uh, uh, basically the, whether the workload has to be generated based on the queue depth or something else then how much of the workload should be reads and uh, as opposed to writes and um, what is the whether the addresses that are generated uh, they should be aligned they are aligned to uh, some uh, granularity or it it is it, it can generate unaligned addresses uh, so if it is true then we need to set the address alignment unit which is uh, in terms of sectors, which is 512 bytes typically. And so here it's set to, let's say 8K. And uh, uh, the request size distribution is fixed. Uh, what is the average request size that is that needs to be generated? So these are some of the, some of the parameters and I would uh, refer you to the readme file in the GitHub uh, repository, uh, which has, uh, a lot of information on all these uh, different parameters that are used for uh, generating the workload. So, uh, so, so we have looked at uh, trace-based workload and also the synthetic workload. Now, when we run the simulator, we will get a output file, which also uh, gives a lot of information. And uh, we need to basically, uh, look at all these different uh, uh, the numbers that it generates and uh, that can be used for our analysis. So I have only shown a part of the output file here. So uh, let's say only the host, uh, uh, the parameters related to the host. So we see the diff the trace uh, file that was used for, uh, uh, for generating the, the workload and uh, we see how many requests have been uh, were processed and within those requests which how many of them were read and write and so on and uh, we also look at the throughput in terms of iops the read throughput and the write throughput and how many bytes are transferred uh, to the device from the, uh, from the request uh, 
um, and how many of them are read and write and the bandwidth of the device, the overall bandwidth and the response times. So these are some of the important things to uh, quickly look at how the how our um, uh, simulator is running and uh, and also if if we have made any changes in the simulator we need to look at these values to uh, understand if if we have improved the performance or uh, we need to investigate further so these are uh, th this is about the host uh, uh, related parameters but uh, if you look at the actual output file then you we will have a lot of um, entries related to the device and uh, and also the different queues that are there in the in the flash translation layer so it will it will give a lot of data which can be useful in uh, analyzing the performance so finally we look at how we use the mqsim and uh, if you are a linux user then uh, we just download the code from the github and then we run make and if we have to run the simulator, then we basically uh, pass the SSD configuration file and the workload definition file in this format, and uh, that will run the simulator. If you are in the if you are in the Windows ecosystem, then you can um, open the solution file that is provided in the git in the code and set it to release or uh, uh, debug and then compile the solution and, uh, and and we can specify the paths within the visual studio environment so uh, so that is about the windows ecosystem so this is kind of a brief introduction of mqsim um, i would encourage everyone to download the code and play with it um, and if you have any questions please uh, feel free to ask uh, ask me or anyone else in the uh, or Mohammed in the group and we'll be happy to help yeah so that's the end of my presentation do you do we have any questions